All right, Dr. Thunder, today we're going to talk about fallen heroes, cancel culture, and redemption. You ready for this, man? I am ready for this. Yeah, man, this is this is going to be a good conversation, I believe, um, especially because I think this topic raises a lot of very important philosophical, ethical questions about how we should respond when role models or heroes fall. Uh, cancel culture, which has been criticized by a lot of people, but is it always wrong? Is it always right? Is it ever appropriate to cancel people? Forgiveness, mm. what does it mean to forgive? Are we always obligated to forgive? Are some things just flat out unforgivable? And redemption, what does a good theory of redemption looks like? I think everybody believes that redemption is possible, but what should you do to redeem yourself if you find yourself having let other people down. So let me back up and give a little context. Here we are at the end of March, 2021, and we're only a few months into the year, and we have already seen a number of role models, thought leaders with uh, positive reputations being uh, entangled with some kind of scandal or issuing an apology because of a, a bad moment or a series of bad moments. Just to give a couple of examples, Derek Jackson is a guy that I didn't know about until recently. He put out a video on YouTube with his wife where he confessed that he had been having an affair. And apparently he is someone that has been putting out a lot of information uh, directed at married couples, teaching them how to make their marriage uh, infidelity proof, how to deal with uh, situations, commits infidelity, giving advice to women on how to see through a cheater and also took a really strong stance condemning people who commit adultery and then this happens and there's been a big hoopla about that we saw kirk franklin popular gospel recording artist who had an argument with his son and the son unbeknownst to him recorded it and in that argument kirk franklin lost his temper and uttered some swear words which is certainly not the sort of thing people expect to hear from their favorite Christian role model gospel musician. Kurt Franklin made a video where he apologized to his fans and you know acknowledged that he's human and so forth, but this was a moment that he had, but that created a lot of hoopla. And then perhaps the biggest one for me personally, and we could go on and on about these, Robbie Zacharias. You and I both went to school together and we used to talk about a lot of his materials together. We used to listen to Robbie a lot. And we both did a tribute episode to him when he died, talking about the way in which he influenced us to think more critically about the Christian faith, about the Bible and about life itself than, than anyone had challenged us to do at that time. And, and so much of the reading that I do today, so much of the conversations I have today were inspired by a sequence of events in my life that that man catalyzed. And then in the aftermath of his death, we received some of the worst news about uh, his treatment of other people and, and things along those lines. And, and his daughter recently had to make a, a statement and RZIM is going through this major process of repentance. And I don't wanna get into the weeds of any particular person's issues. And I don't want to unfairly lump everybody's story into the same category because something like Kirk Franklin's apology and Ravi Zacharias's allegations, two totally different kinds of things. We shouldn't lump them into the same category. And that's an important piece of the puzzle. But, but I do want to ask a couple of questions about situations like this, because all of these people have in common, people that looked up to them, people that were inspired by them, and now you've got people that are let down, people that are wounded, people whose testimony is negatively affected by these falls. And you also have people who are mocking them, people that are calling them out publicly, people that are saying, hey, we shouldn't buy their books, we shouldn't listen to them anymore, we should be done with them. So I wanna dive in and talk about that, man. So here's my first question to you, and we can go with this conversation leads. How should we respond? when our role models fail. Yeah, so, you know, the first the first thing is that, you know, everyone's human. And one of the reasons for not sort of elevating 
our heroes so high, you know, as to sort of occupy the space of that only God should occupy to sort of create um, idols out of people is because people are going to disappoint you. They're going to do things that, um, you know, that they're, they're going to make mistakes. Um, and one thing that I've, that I've noticed is that, uh, there seems to be a disproportionate tendency for folks that have an unusual skill, uh, or, uh, have an unusual influence based on some innate ability for those people to fall. Um, you know, when, when you're on top, you know, they, 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 you know, one of the things is, you know, it's lonely on top. We, we hear people talking about it being lonely on top. Well, it's lonely on top because there are a few people that you can really have uh, a meaningful conversation with about the things that you struggle with. Uh, because there's very few people that are going to understand that the, the, you know, the sort of higher up you, you get and the more eyes that are on you. Um, I think it's one of the reasons why, um, celebrities tend to marry other celebrities and, you know, the stuff disproportionately doesn't work out, but at least, you know, the other celebrity is going to, in some way, understand what they're dealing with. Um, mm. uh, you know, fre frequently it's like, it's like, why, why did, uh, uh, Michael B. Jordan, for instance, uh, he's what he's, he, he married, um, uh, what, what's her name? Um, Harvey, her last name's Harvey. He's one of, uh, uh, why can't I think of my man's name? Uh, the comedian, uh, uh, television host, um, it, one of his daughters. Um, I'm looking it up for you now. I don't know. It's yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Steve Harvey. Steve Harvey. Um, okay. But one of his we, need, we need to be like the Joe Rogan show where he's got that cat licking up references right. for him on the spot. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> but it's like, okay, we work well, why, on the production. Oh, we work on the production. <laughs> it's like, but why would you do that? Like, you know, she's doesn't seem like she's at his level, but she's in the, you know, she's she's a star, you know, everybody knows who she is. And so she would have some kind of understanding of what that's like. And so it seems like mm -hmm. a bad decision to uh, many uh, folks, especially folks in the, you know, in the manosphere and, um, you know, different things you see. Uh, but, <laughs> but, you know, it kind of makes sense then. So I think the first thing is just to recognize that these folks are, are human. Um, you know, our heroes are, are human and we have to, uh, always keep that in mind. Now, does that mean that what it is that they said, everything that they said is now wrong? Um, well, you know, you have these, uh, logical fallacies and, and I think that would be one of them is to suggest that because someone has some sort of failing that then anything that they have uttered or anything that they suggested is now, you know, you know, fruit, fruit from the poison tree, you know, poisonous tree or something. And that's just not how it works. It's one of the reasons why you want to, with rigor, you want to evaluate anything that anybody says, and you want to use the same measurements. You don't want to just believe something because it's your, you know, it's your favorite person to listen to. You want to evaluate what they're saying. You want to weigh it against other things that other people are saying, you know? Um, and then if they fail, you you can still hold on to those whatever those things that you learn from them you know yeah man when i think about how we should respond when our role models fail which is a different question from what do i need when someone 
when someone harms me and, and, and I, I, I want to keep those separate, but how should I, how should we respond? I don't think there's a single right answer to this, but I think about the story of uh, the Pharisees and the adulterous woman and how they bring her to Jesus. And they say, you know, we caught this woman in the very act and the law says she should be put to death. And then Jesus writes something in the sand. And then he says, let he who was without sin cast the first stone. And then they drop their stones and they go. I don't think the moral of that story is that we don't have the right to call right, right and wrong, wrong. I don't think the moral of the story is that we should never call people out and hold them accountable because none of us are perfect. But I do think part of the moral of that story is that our first preoccupation with sin should be the kind that lies within, that we should always be more concerned about our own unreconciled shadows, about our own unresolved issues, more than we are concerned about the unresolved issues of others. I think as a first line of, of thinking, because there is a certain kind of joy, a certain kind of uh, default integrity you can feel about yourself when you see someone else fall. And I think we have to be honest with ourselves about the fact that it's kind of fun, man. It's kind of fun to see people fall. It's kind of fun when we watch people that maybe have more than us or seem to be doing better than us um, stumble and fall. Because in, in some ways, especially if that's not us, we get to feel a little bit better about ourselves. But whenever someone falls, I think it's an opportunity to engage in, in self-examination. And the Bible actually teaches this, not because you might have the same weaknesses as those people, but because we all have our weaknesses. We all have our points of vulnerability. And when people we look up to give in to those weaknesses, it's a reminder that that too is possible for us. If it's possible for them, it's possible for us. And we have to make sure we do the hard work of guarding our own hearts with diligence. And, and we can't take integrity for granted. That integrity is not this thing that just automatically comes. That integrity is something that takes mindfulness. It takes deliberate living. It takes planning. It takes accountability. It takes investing in a healthy lifestyle and in healthy relationships. And none of us are above temptation. Now, now it may not be gambling for me. And so when I see someone get caught up in a gambling scandal, it might be really easy for me to laugh at that and be like, ha, 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 and make videos mocking that person because that might be not be not my thing. You know, not every sin is a temptation for everybody, right? You know, a sin is something that is wrong, but a temptation is an alluring, attractive opportunity to engage in sin. And maybe gambling ain't my thing. Maybe alcohol, alcohol ain't my thing. Whatever it may be, you know, but for one person, it could be vanity, the way in which praise goes to their head. For another person, it could be um, a failure or a weakness in, 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 in the arena of setting healthy boundaries for themselves. It could be a lack of control over um, over appetite and, and, and not just sexual appetite, but appetite for food and other sorts of things. And, and we always have to be mindful of the fact that every single one of us can trade away our destiny in exchange for the immediate gratification of doing what is easy, doing what is convenient, doing what is comfortable, even if it's socially acceptable, especially if it's socially, socially acceptable. Because a lot of the scandals that we look at are not socially acceptable scandals, but there are a lot of empires that are lost because of socially acceptable scandals that we allow ourselves to get entangled in. Socially acceptable sins, I mean. So. I don't think that's the final word on the conversation. I think we, I think it is important for us to talk about the right and wrong of what other people do. But, but I, I think we have to make sure we're careful to not be too happy to do that. I, I, I think we should do that with the reverence for our own ability to fall in our own unique way. Yeah, the the Bible says, you know, remove the log out of your own eye before you attempt to remove the speck out of your brother's eye right and yeah now one thing that's interesting about that is i don't think that the implication there is that necessarily your sin was is worse than the sin that you're trying to remove from your brother's eye what i think is happening there is that 
um, if you have a speck in your eye, by the time you see your brother, that speck is covering most of your brother up, right? Because of, because that one little speck that's in your own eye keeps getting bigger and bigger as you look at stuff that's further and further outside of yourself. So it actually is blocking your ability to, to clearly see <laughs> what other folks are, are doing. And, uh, and so it's, mm -hmm. it's important that we address our, our own stuff um, and be willing to, um, I, I don't know this, you know, grace, you know, like I, I know that, <laughs> I mean, I'm, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm like everybody, you know, I, I have struggles just like everybody. So why wouldn't, you know, some of our heroes have the same, or all of our heroes have the same struggles, you know? And so, yeah, it would be better if they didn't fall. And maybe it's an opportunity for certain folks that maybe were on the fence about something and then they see that happen and maybe that throws them, you know, on the other side of the fence. Um, you know, and that's, you know, why, that's why there's some strong language in the Bible about, you know, people that lead folks astray. Um, you know, but hey, man. You know, this, this is what happens. And I do think that the media in our culture in gen general, our society, American society, um, it really salivates at the opportunity to knock someone down. It's like they build them up with the expectation that they're going to get the opportunity to knock them down. And I don't think that that's particularly healthy. Um, it's definitely not right. Yeah, anytime you have someone that is an advocate for uh, an idea or a principle that offers people freedom or that, that yeah, that just helps people live, you know, fuller lives, it's a victory for someone when, when they fail because, because their failures become an attack vector for um, whatever that cause was they were fighting for. And, and, and there is a certain sadness to that. One thing I, I like to hear your thoughts on, man, is my question presupposes that it's an actual failure or an actual fall. Some people would say that when we see these types of scandals, that hypocrisy is being exposed. So for instance, you and I have seen instances where someone really was a good person and they became a professor, they became a celebrity, they worked really hard, they got into this position of power and they truly were a good person. And they started to make soft choices over time. And they fell into some kind of self-destructive habit and they got in way too deep and everything came crumbling down in their lives because of that. They started off good but they got corrupted or, the, or they fell to temptation. Some people, however, go into a field saying, I'm gonna scam everybody, I'm gonna rip people off. And you have that in every area of life, including religion. There are people that see preaching or having a church as being profitable, putting themselves in a position to exploit people and so on. When you look at leaders and role models who, who fall, do you tend to look at it as a moment where, A, that was a wolf in sheep's clothing and this moment revealed them for who they've always been? Or do you tend to look at that as, that might've been a good person and they just fell by the wayside? Curious your thoughts on that. Well, well one thing is interesting is, uh, you know, the Bible said that there's no one good but God. You know, so we throw around this, you know, such and such is a good person, such and such is a good, is a bad person. And I think that that uh, can blind us from uh, the fact that we're all human and we all have the tendency to fail. Um, and, you know, maybe the, the, the precise combination of events has not occurred yet to cause us to fail, <laughs> but uh, we all have that potential to fail. Um, and to fail massively <laughs> straight face plant, 
you know, <laughs> so, uh, so that's that, you know, that's, that's one thing, uh, you know, so if, you know, bring up this thing with Derek Jackson, um, cause you know, it's one of these hot topics right now. I think a lot of folks will know who we're talking about. Um, but one angle on Derek Jackson is that this is a young guy and, uh, Part of me doesn't think that he was prepared for the sort of kind of ease of access um, to, you know, to women, to, you know, to all this stuff, you know, uh, you know, how do you prepare for like becoming so successful in such a short period of time and all of the money and all of the, you know, women in your DMs? And all of this stuff, I mean, and this is a young guy and I was trying, I'm trying to place myself back in sort of, if I was that age, uh, you know, I'm 46 now and, you know, you know, knock on wood, you know, um, you know, I pray that I have learned something um, and that I have become more mature beyond certain kinds of feelings. I hope that's the case. Um, you know, and I strive to be better each day, but say 15 years ago or something, was I there? I don't know if I was or not. And so the first thing is to look at what age a person is and, and to actually try to put yourself in, you know, in that frame of mind. And then the second thing is to say, you know, if you hadn't had a certain kind of attention, access to money, and then just, just women throwing themselves at you left and right, like crazy, you know, it's like, I don't, I'm just going to be honest. I, I don't know many guys, honestly, I don't know many guys, even my age, that if they had that kind of ease of access, that they wouldn't probably slip up once or twice. Um, now, hey, can, I, can I say something here? Up a lot. Hmm? Well, this is interesting because you're talking about this idea of, of treading lightly and being careful when you make judgments about people's failings, because you, you may not know just how vulnerable you could be if you were in the same situation. Well, what's interesting about um, it's it's Derek, right? Yes. Okay. What's interesting about Derek's situation is that it's actually an illustration of that. Because if I understand things correctly, I, I listened to Charlemagne the God talk about this. He, he you know, he does his donkey of the day thing. And, and, and it's, he, he does like a whole 10 minute rant on it. And, and he goes in pretty mercilessly on them. But one of the things that, that Charlemagne really hammers down on is it's not the fact that he failed. People understand failure. It's the fact that he talked an awful lot about people who have the same oh. kinds of failures in a way that yeah. was equally merciless. Like he spent a lot of time saying, I have no mercy on people who fail in this way, yeah. condemning them, calling them out. And so it's a good so, example of that's how telegraphing. Sometimes so that's telegraphing, you know, uh, telegraphing, you know, sometimes people, uh, they, they will be really, really strict against stuff that they themselves struggle again, struggle with. Um, it's a pretty, it, I mean, it's, it, it's almost a cliche, you know, like that this, this is so common that you find out that someone, they were the, you know, they were the, uh, uh, you know, the dating coach or they were the preacher or something that was condemning a certain kind of behavior. And then you find out that they themselves are, you know, uh, heavily engaged in that, in, in that behavior. Um, yeah. And, and sometimes it's amazing that people can, though they know what they're doing and they must have some self-awareness that what they're doing is wrong because they're preaching against it because they're telling people that it's wrong, that behavior, but, but they still are able to do what they do with a certain kind of 
charisma, you know, like with a certain kind of, you know, it's like, they're still convincing they're in the middle of doing all of this dirt and they're still super convincing, you know, that, and that part of that is kind of scary because you want to think that you have some kind of ability to see if somebody is pulling your leg or not. Um, but I, I don't know. I think for me, what it does is it shows how complicated people actually are and how mm. actually sort of sequestered we can keep certain aspects of ourselves um, while we're, you know, operating in a different capacity. Yeah, it also speaks to the be wise as serpents, harmless as doves part. I, I think a lot of people need to be more educated on the be wise as serpents part, but I think here's where the be harmless as doves part comes in for anyone that is a leader, because we all have role models, but we're also role models to someone else. And you don't get to decide that you can, you can play the game of, I refuse to own the fact that I'm someone else's role model, or I refuse to represent myself as a role model but you are a role model to someone else because there are people that choose to look up to you, whether you like it or not. And then there are people that aspire that inspire you to become a better version of yourself. And so we're all in this position of being a role model. And I think one of the most important aspects of being a good role model is teaching and coaching and inspiring people from a place of empathy, remembering that you too are human, that you had to learn the things that you now know and that you don't always perfectly execute on the ideas that you espouse. I think that's that's the key there, at least what I see in that that Derek story. Just, you know, preach with some humility. It's okay to preach. I mean, we have to, man, we have to. We, we can't allow our own imperfections to scare us away from speaking truth. And we need to have the boldness to look at wrongdoing and say, hey, man, that's not right. It's not right. And at the same time, we can we can couple with that boldness and ability to say, I totally understand how somebody can do something like that. I totally get it. I'm not mystified at all. It happens to a lot of us. And if that particular thing wouldn't happen to me, there's something else, some other area of life that I have a weakness in and people could hate on me for falling in that area. So I don't preach from the mountaintop, somebody that's perfect. But at the same time, let's hold ourselves accountable to what's right because ideals are worth striving for even when we struggle in our efforts to meet them. I, I, I wanna go to the second question though, man, if, if, if I can, because I, I, I wanna, I think this is a good segue into this whole topic of cancel culture and accountability. Two of the extremes that we've seen with cancel culture is the extreme of those who believe that it's always right, right? Cancel culture equals accountability. And if, if you're being canceled, then quit crying about it. You shouldn't have done what got you canceled. Cancel culture is always right. And then there's the other piece where cancel culture is always suspect. It's a purely liberal thing. It's a purely progressive thing. It's a purely Hollywood elite thing of, you know, it, it's some sort of childish Gen Z thing, whatever it may be. Question I'm gonna ask for you, man, is cancel culture sometimes right? We've talked about this and I know that we believe that it's sometimes wrong, but is it sometimes right? Is there ever a time and place to cancel people and say, hey, go away? So let me give you an example of, of two of the people that we've mentioned. I've heard conversations about Ravi Zacharias saying that his books should be removed from the shelves because it not only triggers people, but given all of the things that have come out about him, it's just a bad look for everybody. I mean, how many Christians in a discussion on apologetics have recommended a Ravi Zacharias book? And it's like, okay, that's not really a good look for you to do that now. Or with, with Derek Jackson, you know, I heard Charlemagne the God say, hey, go away for a few months, disable your social media for at least a few months and go get help and things like that. Could it be the case that cancel culture, as annoying and unsympathetic as it might sometimes seem, be a good force for holding people accountable 
is it important to make examples out of people and, and not move too quickly into the discussion of, oh, let's just forgive. Nobody's perfect. There has to be some kind of accountability, right? What's your take? So my basic answer to the question is no. Um, cancel culture is not the same as accountability. Um, the issue that I have with cancel culture is uh, that it's trivial. Okay, so it seems to be an attempt to quiet certain opinions uh, that are not convenient or that are against this sort of orthodoxy uh, to prevent people from uh, with boldness uh, to be able to discuss or, or to discuss um, things that are outside of the Overton window. Okay. That seems to be what cancel culture is more about. It's sort of trying to create uh, a, a kind of uniform, a kind of uniformity um, and cancel culture being this sort of method by which to compress. All right. Accountability, of course, on the other hand, um, that's a different matter. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, and, and, and then, I mean, there's like a, a lot of things we could talk, a lot of angles, like we could talk about the wisdom, a wisdom angle. Let's talk about Ravi. Okay. Yeah. It's probably not the right time to to recommend Robbie's books, even if they're the best book on the topic, you know, at least for a time, you know, that maybe that's wisdom. That's, I don't think it necessarily has to be sort of mixed with, are we sort of throwing out everything that this guy ever did as being of, of none effect. And then therefore also, if you bring him up, then you risk, you risk being canceled. Because, hey, you know, Utch and such is still, you know, is still referencing Zacharias books and he's still telling folks to, to deal with that. Um, he must he must agree with, uh, you know, whatever wrong stuff that Zacharias did um, or, or or maybe he's a denier. He's a denier. Mm -hmm. he, he He's saying that all oh, this stuff is a conspiracy. That stuff never really happened, you know, or whatever. Um, so. So, yeah, so I think it's, it, it's not the same, um, in, but, but it's tough. I mean, it, yeah, I mean, I think there's some wisdom in, di you know, creating some distance. Um, one of the big mistakes that Derek made was he just kept getting on social media and just doing one thing after the, the next that was, that was silly. And that actually tells me that although he has all this money, uh, he doesn't have a multitude of counselors because <laughs> he's putting himself at risk. I mean, this cat is like, this cat was uh, making response videos to, to the, the video that, you know, he was on the couch. He deleted the video, the response video. This cat is talking in third person and stuff. I mean, now there's some other things. I, I did an episode on Thunder's Thoughts where, I, I was talking about narcissism and I covered a few different folks and I covered Derek also. And I wasn't necessarily saying definitively if the people that I was, I was covering were necessarily narcissists or not, but I was just asking the question and I was showing some right. clips and this dude, man, the third person thing is not, is not a good look. It's just, just don't do that. And in, into an earlier point, um, you know, the, the, if, if you're going to be preaching and like you said, it's important for us to say this behavior is wrong. That thing is wrong to preach and to, to try to hold a standard and to try to display to, 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 uh, to speak on what the standard is. That is very important, but maybe rather than you don't do this, you don't do that, or you have an issue with this and you have an issue with that. Maybe use the word we more often. We have an issue with this. We have the tendency to do 
that because then it doesn't seem like you're trying to separate yourself, you know, uh, and I think there's wisdom on two sides of that. One, you're not on record, you know, um, uh, you know, all the time, basically with, with nice bite size clips that make it seem like you're suggesting that you're better than everybody else is. <laughs> That's the first thing. And then the second thing is, uh, you know, look, it, it's an acknowledgement that, look, I'm, I'm, I'm the same as you. We, we're all, you know, we're all in this together. I'm the person standing up here saying this stuff right now, but we're all in this, we're all in this boat together, you know? So, so first, I like your distinction between cancel culture and accountability. Uh, if I had to summarize it, I think cancel culture has as its aim power, whereas accountability has as its aim progress. The purpose of accountability is to reinforce your ideals for the purpose of making you better, whereas cancel culture seems to be about enforcing someone else's ideas for the purpose of making you conform. And I like that right. example that you used about wisdom, how as an individual, it might be wise of me to not recommend certain books at this time if it's going to be more of a distraction than it is a benefit. The cancel culture element is the one that threatens you and says, hey, listen to me. If you ever find it to be beneficial, for some conversation you're in to reference that book, I'm gonna threaten you and take you down and try to rob you of your job because I don't like that. And I designate myself to be the central planner, the central authority over what ideas can be discussed, what people can be admired and so on. Mm -hmm. I, I like that. Here's a follow-up I have because I do want to, to delve a little bit more into this issue of accountability, something that a lot of organizations have been charged with, especially the church, but a lot of organizations have been charged with this, is creating these cultures of enablement where powerful people get away with doing things that other people would never be allowed to do. And sometimes the whole forgive and forget mindset, the whole, um, hey, none of us are perfect mindset can be a means by which powerful people can continue to exploit vulnerable people. And so my question to you is what, what responsibility do organizations or leaders in these organizations, churches and so on have to hold people accountable when, when things like this happen. And I understand that some of these people are like individual thought leaders who are just kind of on their own and their audience has to decide if they still want to rock with them. But when you're part of an organization, what, 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 what are your views on the responsibilities there? Is, is it important to, to, to fire people, to let them go, to make an example out of it? Uh, yeah. <sighs> okay. So, I have to say that a lot of the church scandals um, are totally preventable. Okay. Uh, much of the stuff that I've seen uh, up close um, and stuff that I've seen from afar, there always is some kind of breakdown in the accountability structure in the in the uh supervision structure there always is some kind of breakdown and let's you know and look i've worked at mega churches before i'm not trying to you know throw the baby out with the bathwater or anything like that however one of the issues with mega churches is that it is, it is virtually impossible. It's virtually impossible to really have the kind of accountability and supervisory structure that would prevent everything from happening. Okay. In a smaller church, you know, everybody knows everybody. And if something starts to go down, you know, yeah. And then if there is a scandal, 
the scandal affects just that small population, right? If, you know, 15, 20, 30,000 member church has, has a big scandal, that's, that's affecting a lot more folks. And again, it's so hard to create a structure that you can actually sort of police a lot of, you know, certain kinds of behaviors. I mean, I see, I, I see frequently, you know, stuff like, you know, uh, don't go out with a female, uh, you know, like if you're work at a church, don't go out with a female, uh, employee for lunch. Okay. Don't do that. You know? And yeah, I, I can see that, that, you know, that, that makes sense. All right. Um, but at one point you're going to have to start using the honor system because, you know, people aren't being followed around with cameras and stuff. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's tough. It, it's a tough situation and, and it makes, I think churches, uh, in organizations beyond a certain size, particularly vulnerable, um, you know, mega church. I mean, I, I will say this, that the, the, the whole mega church sort of format, um, it's not the biblical model. I mean, it's clearly not the biblical model. I mean, it, I don't know if, if you have to have a staff of pastors in order to uh, cater to the needs of the congregation, and the senior pastor has no, hardly any interaction with the congregation, that tells me that the church is too big. You know, and so... Yeah, I mean, so a lot of these kinds of issues, um, I mean, there's a lot of really, really big evangelical churches, for instance, and that's the kind of community that Zacharias comes out of, is that that evangelical thing. And um, other Protestant um, sort of streams, the evangelical thing is the thing I think I most identify with, which is which is kind of an interesting Thing, since I'm Orthodox and that's pretty far away from Orthodox, but there seems to be things about that, that seem to speak to me on a certain level in, in even like, uh, streams of thought, um, ap Christian apologetics. And a, a lot of that stuff is, is really heavy in those kind of circles. And so, you know, I really identify with that, but I think that there's some serious problems with the way that the structure is set up because it doesn't, it doesn't provide, it, it's not, you can't, you can't police that many people. It's, it's like so many people. I mean, how are, how are you going to do it? You're just going to have scandal after scandal, after scandal, after scandal. And, and that's been the history of it. I mean, it, it's, it keeps going. So. Yeah. And, and you're, you're clearly not making excuses saying that it's okay to have these scandals or scandals should be expected. No. You're saying it's important to have a, a structure that allows scandals to be identified early on. If, if any time you have an organization, church or not, human beings are a part of that organization, human beings are going to do human things. And sometimes that means hurting other people. And you want to build your leadership model in such a way so that when, not if, those types of things happen, the culture sniffs them out very quickly and deals with them very quickly. And you're saying that mega church model is not optimized for that. I would love to maybe have somebody like Pastor Joel Brooks on with us, who oh, we, yeah. we, we we both know him mutually. It would be really cool to have him talk about that because I don't know if, if if Christian Life Center is described as a mega church, but it's a pretty big church. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty I, big I, I love, church. I hear, yeah, yeah. I, I love to hear what he has to say about that and what what he thinks about the topic of accountability what could organizations do what should organizations do but i want to move to this this next question here man um because sure. this is with the topic of redemption what does a good theory of redemption look like so i wrote this post that was interestingly controversial i wrote a post that said if there's no room in your worldview for redemption there's no room for you now, I thought that was pretty obvious and uncontroversial because the the very concept of learning and making progress presupposes 
that there is room for us to overcome the realities of our past, that we That's all right. have failures mistakes. in our past. We all have mistakes. And I'm going to go further than mistakes because I think mistakes is a nice diplomatic term. We all have moments in our path where we did something that we knew at that time we should not have done. We have all looked the truth in the face and given it the middle finger before. We've all done that before. Yeah. Um, and a part of growth means that you have to honestly look at those moments and say, I know that I was capable of better. I know that I'm capable of being better today. And I thank God for having a second chance and I'm going to get it right. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to pull myself up. I'm going to receive the grace necessary to do better. So I, I think redemption is important. And if we get rid of the idea of redemption, we get rid of progress for all of us, not just the people that do the socially unacceptable bad things, because there's a lot of socially acceptable stupid too. <laughs> but at the same time, this was controversial because there were people that were like, hey, man, look, some things are just unforgivable. You don't want to go too far with the whole redemption notion. And, you know, what if you were the one that was hurt by something evil that a person did? Now, just for the record, my life has been directly hurt by evil things that evil people have done. So I don't talk about this topic with a lack of empathy or, or a personal experience. But I, I think there are two things we can do at the same time. One, one is we can allow room for redemption. And two, we can allow room for people that have been hurt by acts of wrongdoing. We can allow them room to process their pain in their own way, in their own timing, without saying, hurry up and get over your pain, right? So advocating for the possibility of redemption is not the same thing at looking at, uh, as looking at the victims of suffering and saying, hey, guys, just get over it. We can be empathetic towards people who suffer while still saying for the people that created suffering, Redemption is a possibility. What I want to know from you, though, is what does a good theory of redemption even look like if someone is seeking redemption in their lives and maybe they even have people that they've hurt or people that hate them for what they've done? What are the steps you take? Well, one thing is that uh, you can't expect that people are going to just forget about what you did or be willing to you know, treat you the same afterwards. Um, that would be selfishness on the part of the, the perpetrator, so to speak, the, the person seeking redemption. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's one thing. Uh, and I think this is hard, but I think people that have been wronged it's important to know the difference between um, desiring justice and desiring vengeance. Mm -hmm. You know, vengeance is not going to, even if you get vengeance, you know, um, it's, it's not going to do anything for you. Um, it's empty, you know, and honestly, even if you get justice, uh, justice is also not going to restore what you lost. You Define know? that difference. For um, me, I well, so, so, so say for instance, um, now usually the people I think that are just seeking justice, I think they, they're aware that it's not going to bring something back. You know, it's an acknowledgement that something happened. Um, it's the willingness for someone to actually apologize for it. You know, those kinds of things. It's, you know, somebody actually maybe doing some jail time for something, you know, people refer to that as being justice, you know, um, but vengeance is, is this thing where, uh, so in the Old Testament, there's a principle, an eye for an eye. Okay. okay. Now, the reason for this principle is that when someone wrongs you, your response will tend to be disproportionate. Hmm. 
Okay. So if somebody takes your arm, I'm sorry, uh, takes, you know, so say, you know, somebody took your hand, for instance, you'd want to cut their arm off. If they took your arm, then you want to, you know, you want to take both arms. Right. So that's the, that's the tendency. It's, there's an escalation. It's a, this like natural escalation that we want. And so an eye for eye for an eye was never to establish a principle of, um, you know, you know, e equality of suffering <laughs> or something. It was never to establish that. It was just to state that, look, we know what human nature is. And just to make sure that the punishment fits the crime, we're going to say apple for apple. Okay. But that's not really, that, that was never intended to be sort of the, the real, the real deal, right? Because the Bible also says, you know, vengeance, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, he's going to repay. And so this sort of, this work of forgiving people um, is, you know, you, you frequently see this and hear this is not really for uh, the other person. It's really for you so that you can get some kind of peace and then you can go on about your, about your life without having this like huge cloud hovering above your head. You know, it's, it's that kind of thing. And, you know, and I've heard people, uh, get different, you know, positions on that. Now understand forgiveness does not mean that you have to trust the person. doesn't mean that you have to put yourself, uh, in, in, a, in a situation, uh, with the same sort of proximity to the, to the perpetrator, you know, submit yourself to them still. In other words, it doesn't mean any of that stuff. You know, it just means you're going to, you're going to move on with your life. Um, and you're going to try to let go of that stuff. So now I want to, I want to contrast what I think like someone that they did something wrong and they try to, to make amends, you know, they try to, you know, uh, change their ways. They see that what they did was wrong. Um, you know, they've truly repented, you know, repentance, uh, thinking again, right. So rethinking, uh, changing the way that you orient to that, whatever that, uh, that you're oriented to, whatever that thing that you did was wrong. Um, seeing the actual evil, the actual wrong that you did, empathizing with the people that you, that you wronged, all of that. There's a difference between that and this sort of um, cliche, this is like a cliche in the, in, uh, you know, the, 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 the thug, the, the, you know, the drug dealer that used the drug money as a seed money for his hip hop career. And then even in the hip hop career is glorifying selling drugs the whole time. And even when questioned after they supposedly had stopped selling drugs, if you weren't, you know, doing the hip hop thing, what would you be doing? And they say, yeah, I'd be selling drugs. So someone that obviously has not changed the way that they see what they were doing before and is still glorifying it and all the people that they hurt, that's of known issue, right? But at least they're not engaged in those in, in those behaviors anymore, but you don't see any evidence that they would be any different or they would do anything different. That doesn't seem to me like a good redemption story. And we love these stories where like the reformed thug story, but in order for it to be like, you know, to really usually make people feel, feel good. It's like, you still want them to still kind of be still kind of be that same thug. You know, but, but they just, they, but they're just doing different things now. You know, they haven't changed their orientation to what it was. And they will actually even tell you, you know, I, you know, uh, if it wasn't for that seed money, if it wasn't for me, you know, selling drugs, I wouldn't be where I am today. So you can't, you know, so I can't totally, you know, feel bad or, or totally condemn the things I came from. I mean, you see the, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, women that strip to, to go to college, you know, this kind of thing. Well, you know, I can't, you know, I can't totally say that that was bad because, you know, you know, that's, that's what provided my situation now. To me, that doesn't seem like redemption. You know, it seems like you still doing, you still doing the same things. You still, your mind is still the same, you know? Um, so hopefully that sort of the, the, uh, um, sort of trying to create some sort of uh, dichotomy or something between those two is, is helpful and explanatory there. Yeah. I, I got something in there. I want to piggyback on, uh, although I, I got to admit, I was distracted when you brought up the, the drug dealers. Cause all I could think about was, uh, get rid of the, the pretentious, uh, detrimental war on drugs. It's economically bad. It's politically pretentious mm -hmm. and fallacious and it only harms the people yeah. that it purports to help get rid of it. Y'all, uh, decriminalize and, uh, and, and let the entrepreneur sort it all out. Um, and, uh, and that's not an endorsement of any kind of substance abuse. Um, it's rather a critique of the abuse of authority uh, in the name of helping people out. Uh, okay, so I, I think I hold, one of the things- And I wholeheartedly endorse that, by the way, what you just said. Yeah. I think one of, one of the things I can gather from what you just said is that redemption is ultimately about a change in mindset, not necessarily about um, maintaining a desirable relationship to your audience or to your fan base or to your friends or to your family. And I, I think redemption often, conversations about redemption often center around questions like that. Hey, how do I keep my audience? How do I keep my fans? How do I keep people looking at me as the awesome person that they used to see me as? And I think it's important to uncouple redemption from that because there is a difference between seeking improvement and seeking approval. Redemption is about seeking improvement. Oh, okay. And, so, and sometimes when you make improvements, there will be people from your past who will still refuse to give you their approval. History is replete with people that lived a past that they chose to overcome. We talked about Malcolm X, Kamau and I, I believe like a week or two ago, and we just talked about the huge difference between his past that sent him to jail and then the person that he became in jail when he began to study and liberate his mind and then the positive impact that he had after leaving jail and the way that he became one of the greatest spokes, spokespersons for, for freedom. And I'm sure we could have found in his day somebody that, were, that was on the streets with him, somebody that went to high school with him that was like, man, get out of here. I believe he actually wrote about that in his autobiography that he had guys that he used to run with on the streets who heard that he converted to religion and he began to, you know, change his ways. And, and they were like, man, we, you know, word on the streets is that Malcolm lost his mind. Malcolm went off the deep end. And anytime you make an improvement in some area of your life, there's going to be somebody from your past that's kind of laughing at you that doesn't take you seriously. They might think it's pretentious. And so I, I think you've got to make seeking redemption something that's bigger than getting other people to like you again. You've got to make redemption about the moral standards and ideals that you, that put that you abandon to put yourself in that position and putting yourself in a situation where you can get better and you can get your life right. And sometimes that might mean taking a break from all those fans. Sometimes that might mean taking a break from all of the people that you want to like you. Sometimes it can be good that those folks turn their backs on you and stop liking you because being addicted to them might have been the problem in the first place. I remember talking to one of my brothers about this, how a lot of people who fall when they achieve this status of icon or celebrity, when you look at the trajectory of a lot of those people, they start off anonymous and hungry. Nobody knows who they are. They're not famous, nobody's seeking their autograph, and they spend a lot of time putting in the work necessary to master their craft. They're in the practice room, they're in the shed, working on their instrument. They're hitting up the books, they're doing their study and their research. They're in the gym, they're working out, they're, they're making themselves better. And it's impossible to be the kind of person who consistently focuses on making yourself better 
without being somewhat magnetic and useful to other people. And the better you become, the more valuable you become economically, spiritually, and so on, the more people will want your help or they might want to associate with you. And that's totally fine. In fact, that's a gift. That's a wonderful thing. But what can happen is you go from this lifestyle where you're investing in your health, in your well-being, in your personal growth, and now your life is all about indulging in the adoration of people that want to be part of the, the fan base or whatever. And, and then you kind of lose sight of the discipline that it takes to be where it is you want to be in life. And you see that happen a lot in, in the sports world, right? There are some athletes, look at last year in the NBA playoffs in the bubble. You, you, had, you had on one end guys like LeBron who just stayed focused. He understood that it's all about basketball. I'm here for one thing. I'm not going to the club. I'm going to focus until the mission is accomplished. And then you had other guys. It's like, okay, here's a guy that just let down his entire team. He's not even going to be able to play in the playoffs. He's going to get sent home because he was out visiting a strip club when, when he was supposed to be in the bubble, like playing with his team. And sometimes you can forget what it takes to get to the spaces you are in and you can you can put the fans and the perks and all that stuff above the practice above the discipline and you can just lose your way and so i think it's very important to develop a theory of redemption that involves being accountable to people involves allowing people to give you constructive feedback but it's much bigger than being liked by people because it's not about being approved of by others it's about striving to improve yourself and overcome overcome your own resistance. Hey, man, we're, yes. we're, we're about at that time. Brother. Let me give you the final word, man. Any final thoughts on this? Yeah, the. Uh, I mean, all of us at some point are going to need some kind of redemption. And so before you snub your nose at the idea of redemption, maybe consider that you yourself are not perfect. Um, I certainly don't want to um, talk down on, on an idea so much that when it is that I actually need it, that that in itself also causes people to have a hard time, um, you know, allowing me to have a second chance. We all, we all need second chances and, third chances sometimes. Um, and that's not to say that it's okay for people to fail, that it's okay for people, um, you know, uh, that are in positions of authority to take advantage of their power, to, to take advantage of people, and that we should treat that, that like, like that's some kind of light in you know, kind of light thing. It's not. We have to acknowledge that stuff hurts people. Um, and profoundly so. You know, so this is not this is not a discussion. What I'm saying now is is not to suggest that um, that we should you know, you know treat that stuff like it's not that in, not that big of a deal. No, I think it's a big deal. Um, but look, this is, uh, it's the nature of things. It's the nature of humanity. Uh, we're all going to make mistakes and, uh, maybe one day you yourself will need redemption. I, I, I know that I, I likely will and already have. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Hey, I think we all already need it. And I think if you think you're somebody that doesn't need redemption, you're either naive or just not being really honest with yourself. But I better stop there for now. If you enjoyed the episode, hit the like button, hit the subscribe for future episodes. If you got a question, you got a comment, anything you want to hear us talk about in the future, please let us know in the comments and please share this episode with a family member, a friend, a complete stranger, an evil person that you hate, whoever needs to hear it. Just get the word out. Thanks for tuning in to Thunder and TK, and we'll see you next time. Peace.